Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Living on Music. I'm Steve Houck. And um, boy, uh, when you find uh, people that have these incredible swaths of musical um, things in their life, and this gentleman today is no exception. Andrew McKnight, um, born in Connecticut, like me, uh, actually, yes, um, in, in that era, in Connecticut, as we both grew up in Connecticut as kids, has become a absolutely wonderful uh, singer, songwriter, musician, producer, teacher of music, um, helping put together many documentaries about music. This guy has has a, a piece of music um, uh, to his heart in so many different ways. And again, so wonderfully talented. And through the show, you'll hear clips of him playing. And also, he did a wonderful song with us at the end. Um, he's not only taught songs to, to to different people, but also everybody from kindergartners to one-on-one um, -on -one with veterans. And uh, that's the uh, uh, kind of the meaning of the song that he that he sang on the show. But anyway, without further ado, let's talk to this guy. What a wonderful uh, visit with him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Living on Music, Andrew McKnight. Andrew McKnight, welcome to Living on Music, my friend. It's lovely to be here with you, Steve. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, glad my, glad my, to welcome you over to my place, too. <laughs> yes, I love that in Lincoln, Virginia. I'm in Burke, Virginia, so we're in the same state and not not too far uh, away from each other. But it is so wonderful to have you as uh, as somebody on Living on Music. I, I have had a wonderful time looking at your really, really uh, exceptional run in the musical world and still going strong. And it, it, it really has been has been an exciting thing to witness. And we'll talk a little bit about your past, present, and future. I loved, right off the top, there's a quote um, on, a, I believe it was either your website or a page of some kind saying, you know, like powerful and entertaining one-man theater, which I love, delivered with warmth, humor, and down-home comfort. Does that description um, talk about Andrew McKnight in a nutshell? I think it works. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think it right. works. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I... Growing up, if you had told 15-year-old me shredding on that Strat for hours in my bedroom that I could have this life in music and this is what it would look like, I wouldn't have been able to imagine it. Um, but uh, I certainly would have said, well, I guess that's cool. That, oh, that's, right. that, sounds, that sounds all right to me. I bet. Um, I, sure I think the, uh, the whole idea of how much the show is more than just the songs, just the delivery of the songs, but all the moments woven through it. Mm -hmm. And as I've gotten uh, more seasoned, I suppose, as, as the decades go by, um, I've grown to appreciate that um, and audiences that appreciate that. So, yeah, I, I guess one man theater does uh, does describe it, although, I, you know, I play solo because there's nobody else here. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and you and I and you will talk a little bit about your your development too, from having that uh, the nor'easter and and then into your solo life. But I I, I started the show um, in the pandemic. Uh, I've been a music journalist for over twenty years, uh, writing for newspapers and magazines. But wanted to do something interviewing people before the pandemic, and then through Zebra Press, we started living on music with me and people live, and then recorded. But it was all done to engage you guys and to engage people who were so used to blending not only with their band, but with, with people and fans and things like that. How did Andrew McKnight, who again, not only music, but teaching guitar and songwriting, offering workshops, doing things like that, consultant for genealogy. I mean, you, you, that's all meeting up with people to a, to a certain extent. How did you get through the last th three years from a largely from a musical and also a life standpoint? Hanging by my fingernails. <laughs> not alone, not alone. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a human being like everyone else. And uh, the whole uh, deprivation of interaction, I mean, talk about so many things that change, you know, just like for somebody who spent, shoot, over the last 30 years, I've driven nearly a million miles touring around this big beautiful country we call home right wow and all of a sudden i'm grounded and 
home is the place that we've learned is safe. Right. If we stay home, we won't die. <laughs> that, I guess that's always been true, sort of, but um, it had a whole new kind of resonance. And, um, you know, I just think to myself that we weren't prepared for that. We weren't, um, you know, emotionally speaking, all of the things that we're still sort of like processing from that time. Mm -hmm. And even now, you know, it, it's it's been really hard for a lot of indie artists who play smaller rooms um the the scene has changed so much so many venues closed less people coming out yeah. um and bigger acts coming down into smaller venues yes um, you know it's been a squeeze from all sides and i i figure you know how how lucky I am that we live in the time of the internet, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think a hundred years before our pandemic was the Spanish flu, and and how everybody did the same thing about staying home, but they didn't have this way to interact. No. And to me, I had been doing live stream concerts. Uh, I started with a platform called UStream.TV. That tells you how long ago it was. Wow. I think it's been about 15 years now that I've been doing some wow. sort of video concert once or twice a year. Oh, great. So I kind of slipped into so that precious. groove pretty and easily, much, and much I have to say it kept me both um, slightly solvent and slightly sane, because at least there was interaction with audiences, and everybody was home, and to be able to do this, uh, to be able to sing for people, and to have their feedback coming through the live chat different than a show disconcerting for a lot of performers for right. me i found that very comfortable and and yes. uh, you know i'm i'm still doing it i i'm still doing those. yeah many of the musicians that i've had and there's been probably over 300 in the last three years uh to talk to from around the world and also the dc amazing dc musical community and many of them uh the higher percentage uh, found positivity from at least finding periods to write periods to interact again, as you say, virtually and things like that, but at least to keep things going. Did you, uh, were you largely alone? Did you have family? What was that like? So uh, my wife and daughter are here. My daughter is uh, almost 17 and she's a fiddler. Oh, beautiful. So I do. I do have the opportunity when, when she's in the mood, uh, we play old time and Irish tunes together. And she sometimes will join me on these live streams too, um, which is great. Um, it's nice. Uh, right. Beyond that, it's been me and the two cats. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, uh, you know, to to keep oneself busy doing constructive things was definitely a challenge. And in fact, really, the road is just I'm over the next, I don't know, two months, I'm out quite a bit. And it's really the first time since the pandemic happened. I was on the road when the world shut down. Wow. I played New Orleans, I played Austin, I played Huntsville, Texas. By the uh, time I got back from that trip on St. Patrick's Day, everything had changed. Wow, isn't that amazing? And that is, again, that's also an uncommon thing for, for you know, hardworking musicians is that you were on a, ro a roll from at least a live standpoint. You have done something recently that we'll talk about first, and that is Treasures in My Chest. And again, an album and a book. So you don't do things just throw music out there. You do more to it, not only talking about things in, in your lyrics, but also an album and a book about your singular experiences exploring family history. We're going to talk a minute about your your grow up and and things like that because we have we have a commonality there um, uh, about your your early life. Um, but talk to me about treasures in my chest and how did that come to be? And was that part of you know the pandemic giving you time to think, or that was that ready for a while? It arrived on my porch when I got back from Texas. It wow. beat me here by a few hours. Yeah, <laughs> I had the, the grave misfortune of releasing, you know, a life's work kind of ambitious project right at the head of the pandemic. Wow. Unbelievable. Um, it, it, you know, as an artist, I, I find sometimes that what I need to do for for me isn't necessarily a thing that fits into the music business or this or that. It's just like, I need to do 
this thing the way that I envision it and right. how we market it afterwards becomes um, okay. Well, uh, yeah, let's sort it out because the first thing is to make the art. Right. And I, I joke often about treasures being the result of my ancestors hijacking my music career. Nice. <laughs> um, the, the, the short, the short story of it is that both my parents took DNA tests and there weren't, you know, incredible surprises, but there were lots of discoveries. And sure. we wound up going to Ireland and Scotland. My mom, dad, my little sister and I, the, the last great nuclear family vacation, I call it in the book. And uh, if, if your nuclear family can spend 16 days in a foreign country in a small minivan driving on the wrong side of the road oh. where sometimes the signs aren't even in English and not achieve fission then we've done something pretty good right, right. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and the experiences that that happened you know so many crazy amazing you can't make this up kind of stuff happen and um the book wound up being uh you know half that and sort of half like taking some of my experiences and research in my own family history and sharing them with people who are just sort of considering the idea of you know, we are a people of stories, right? And each of us is the heir to millions of stories, most of which we'll never know. Right. But the ones that we do and the ones that we find, whether sure. they're the, the rogues and the renegades or the Samaritans and the saints, it doesn't really matter. They're right. all part of our story, too. Right. And that's that's ours to keep for ourselves. And we can highlight or and hide as we see fit. But the fact is all of that stuff is there and that makes us kind of fascinating individuals sure. each of us oh absolutely I, I just, uh, the book the book and the album both kind of wound up being like just boom out of all of that oh that's that's wonderful there's also an introductory how-to manual yeah and yeah. And, and what was it how toing? so um the first thing is uh, the whole bit about dna what okay. what you can learn what you can't you know, sure. the sorts of things that people do, but oh, also trying to put some of those family stories in context, right? Wow. We tend to look at everything through the lens of our time, right? Yeah. Looking back at history and judging people and judging events and judging how things happen through the lens of our time. Right. But those people didn't live in the lens of our time. That includes your ancestors. And they didn't have electricity they didn't have mobility they didn't have right. all of these things and yet they lived their lives what was that like wow. what did they do and and how you know we just like walk out on my porch and watching the sunset right yeah well a thousand years ago your ancestors were watching the sunset kind of with the same sort of fascination about sure, it. you never sure. think about that stuff though no they don't no that's fascinating i i, I love that and then you said it was ready to come out or ready to be released right right as in 2020 i guess when the pandemic hit it, when did it actually get put out there for people to hear we had the the album release concert here in in western loudon at franklin park arts center march 6th nice oh march, march 6th, 6th. <laughs> today <laughs> and it was um the last show they had at franklin park before the pandemic closed it down Wow. It was an amazing night. I mean, I'm... I have this <laughs> I have this quilt that my three times great grandmother started when she was 12 years old. So it's 1835. 100 years later, one of her descendants sends it off to get it turned into a quilt, all these squares. Well, we hung the quilt uh, above the stage for the treasures in my chair. Show. I love it's that. Nearly 200 years old, and it's just the craziest stuff, man. Well, that's why I, I had to put this up. I uh, was either going to put it up at the beginning or now because I, I noticed the, the, you know, the Margaret naming and these other people. Now it completely makes sense of of why there are these aged, wonderful pic pictures of of people like that. I, I love that. That's, that's really neat that you went ahead and did that. Um, what I'd love to do is um, I want to talk a little bit about what, what else you're doing right now. Uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, some of the, the, the lessening and uh, the lessons and things like that, but, but I'd love to go down your, your early road and just talk a little bit about how Andrew McKnight got the music to where it is really soared. I mean, the number of albums, we'll talk about a bunch of this right now. But you were born where exactly? Um, I was actually born in my dad's hometown of Bristol, Connecticut. I grew yes. up in eastern Connecticut on the Rhode Island border. 
Well, that's exactly. I grew up in Wilton, which was oh, okay. Yeah, over in Fairfield County in Western Connecticut. Um, and when I saw that, I was like, "Oh God!" He also grew up in Connecticut, not only four years apart. Um, I'm four years older, about about uh, that. This was my favorite Connecticut venue when I was a kid, and it was the, one of the first concerts I'd ever seen at the Waterbury Palace Theater. Did you ever get a chance to go there in your in your time? I did not. Oh uh, yeah, the, not. The, the, this was an amazing place, and I just wanted to put a. A, a, a shared Connecticut place for for both of us. I went to see ZZ Top here uh, nice. on their Fandango tour, and it was spectacular. They, had, in fact, down on the the stage, they had uh, horses and so, a cow go by, and they were, like, they were having a blast. But you you grew up in Bristol. I know I know I know Bristol uh, quite well. No, uh, this, my dad grew up in Bristol. The, your dad I grew, grew up in Plainfield. Which, if you come from Southwest Connecticut. And you've never been to Eastern Connecticut. It's not at all the same. It, yes, right. It, it is it's a different rural and 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 different. It's definitely different. Yes, um, I I did spend more of my time in Western. I went to University of Hartford for two years. I was born in Norwalk. My dad worked in New Canaan, so it was all really down in that little part of Connecticut. But you grew up in the rural hills and mill towns of, of there. Yeah. Uh, I love this. It was in a musical household where your father's bands would rehearse in the basement. Now, that can be very good, and it sounds like it was, or it can be, you know, a lot of noise to some families. How did it look to young Andrew? It sounds like it was a wonderful influence on you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I um, I would sneak out of bed <laughs> and, go, and go sit on the basement stairs because there was a wall. Oh. And my dad and his keyboards were set up around behind the wall, so he couldn't see the stairs. Oh. And so I could see the guitar player and the drummer, and I could kind of watch everybody else. And as long as I didn't make any noise and call any attention to myself, oh. uh, you know, I could stay for a little while until I got caught. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I was like, uh, at an early age, I wanted in on that. But I, I never remember, like, life without music happening in the in the basement, you know. And it was pretty regular they'd practice once a week or something and my dad was a school teacher back when in oh. connecticut they didn't pay school teachers enough to even have a house no. or anything so no. he um he played in a band to make money on weekends so wow. that was what i was used to so i hear them picking apart all the vocal harmonies of, yeah you know the beatles or doobie brothers or santana all the all the you know the sort of pop and rock music of the day and so I just grew up, I, I, I sometimes describe it as having grown up in, a, in an indigenous culture with no written language, because wow. I heard it all. It was oh. all oral or oral, you know? And so uh, I just been immersed in it my, my whole life. Oh, spectacular. And it seems like that kicked you into about 12 years old when you started playing guitar um, and you got the Strat when you were 15. Um, yeah. And I love that. And cover band you it's I I think I read that you were in a cover band with adults so you were now that is a unique experience and had to be pretty dynamic for a 15 or 16 year old to play bars weddings for some pretty good cash that summer yeah yeah I saw some stuff man <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just let me just describe it to you as an example please there's Eastern Connecticut is a lot of different things and the eastern connecticut of my youth and in particularly in the borderlands along rhode island very rural very hilly a lot of state forest and rhode island is pretty rural on its western border too right which meant that kind of anything goes mm -hmm. um there was not a lot of law enforcement presence in a lot of those uh in a lot of those places so oh. I remember playing at a wedding and there we were playing, there were people dancing and a fight breaks out on the dance floor between one bridesmaid and some other gal. And it was a, it was a kind of bikery wedding and uh, this big biker dude with leather and all watched him fight for about 10 seconds and just picked up the two of them with one hand and just oh. flung them through the door. <laughs> and we just kept on playing. <laughs> oh my God. I've seen all kinds of things when I was growing up, 
playing in bars and, oh, I and, bet. Uh, and even weddings and stuff. Yeah. Just the, the kind of like, you know, nothing, it got to the point where nothing really surprised me anymore. I mean, there were a lot of like, you know, nice and fancy things and all that, but there was a lot of wild side oh. kind of stuff too. So yeah, bet. my eyes got kind of big every now and then when I was 15, 16. I bet. And, you know, that had to add some some kind of t to the mind of a growing up boy. But also it sounds like the music really was beginning to to hit hit you hop solid there. Did you get a sense even at 15, 16, 17 that music really was going to be what you were going to do in life? Or was that just going to be part of it and you had another kind of something you were interested in? Well, both of my parents are teachers and they... Yeah strongly encouraged me that music was always a great way to make money on the side and a terrible livelihood. And they were right. Right. Um, right. But <laughs> the, uh, the truth of the matter is I never learned how to read. Oh. I really wanted to go to Berkeley and I tried to teach oh. myself how to read. And this is before YouTube and the yeah. internet and all the rest of it. And it was just, it, Ah, I never, I never grasped it. And even now I'll write out stuff for my students using tab on the computer. And uh, I look at stuff on the staff and I can read the rhythms and stuff and painstakingly, I can, you know, work my way through single string, you know, flat pick and bluegrass tunes and stuff like that. But I never really grabbed a hold of that. And that was the impediment. Sure. So I was like, well, I'm not going to be, you know, playing music for a living. I can't play, you know, as, this was the golden era of rock guitar too. Totally. Right? I mean, I'm 14 when the first Van Halen record comes out and here's ACDC and here's Ozzy with Randy Rhodes playing guitar. And I'm like, Oh, you know, it's like, I, I want to be able to do that. But there was like so many incredible guitar players. Yeah. They're all over the place in that era. Everywhere. Sure. So it was kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I always was creative. I, I started writing the minute I could play an E chord. I started sliding it around on the guitar neck right. and making sounds out of it. So I kind of gravitated towards, well, if I'm not going to go to music school, I'm going to go to school for something to make money and I'm going to make music that I want to make. Sure. So I kind of ditched the the wedding and bar band scene for a while there and, and uh, focused on that. That was the whole Nor'easter project. That was 20 years old, 1984. Um, it was Nor'easter and it was a hard rock, early 80s, heavy metal sounding band. Was that the way that they that they were from beginning until when you weren't playing anymore with Nor'easter? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, we started creating our own songs. I mean, we were playing a lot of that same material, too, because you couldn't play all original music in Eastern Connecticut anywhere. Uh, right. And But this was your this was your first big foray into songwriting. How did that come to bear? How did that begin? Uh, you know, it's funny. The creative process is really uh, fascinating to me. And even though I teach songwriting, I still I, I describe it as part part craft, part art, and part voodoo, because, you know, <laughs> right. without the voodoo part, the other stuff doesn't just, like, jump out, right? Right. So, you know, I might be playing around, working on something on the guitar, and like, oh, that's really cool sounding, and the next thing I know, I'm building something out of that, and then, you know, like, hmm, that, we could, we could put some lyrics to that, that would sure. be kind of cool, and um, I think I'd always uh admired songwriters um, right. for for a lot of different reasons but there was also a lot of really good diverse music that i was hearing in my you know in the in the 70s and in the early 80s and just like all of the creativity i mean you you'd hear like queen back to back with earth wind and fire back to back with you know just the amount of diversity in a, a an fm radio hour totally know, would be pretty incredible yeah so it was like i didn't really have a whole lot of limitation about what i might want to write you know it's like and and it was like this heavy sound was pretty big when we were finishing high school it's like yeah you know it would be really cool oh, to I... do something like that and nor'easter was a was a trio with a singer. Yep. Wow. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, right. There's only three of us left, to, you know, walking the earth, but uh, uh, it was a, it was a, the classic heavy metal trio, three guys playing instruments plus a singer. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's great. You released heavy it. Metal math. 
you released, uh, 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 you recorded an album, uh, Calm Before the Storm, um, but it it never got released. And it obviously, I mean, it, it did in 2022. Uh, but um, why didn't it get put out then? It was just not timed, timed, timed well? Um, we recorded the album two years after our final show. The drummer, the singer, and I went in the studio. Um, the studio was our friend's basement. He had a four-track cassette machine when we started. And when we started working in there, he's like, hmm, this dude's selling an eight-track reel-to-reel. I think I want to record you guys on that. I'm going to go get it. Oh. So, 1989, it's the summer between uh, college and grad school for me. Right. And I'm off to grad school at UMass Amherst. I'm not going to be around, you know? And so we worked all summer long, got as much done as we could, made a decent rough demo mix of it. And that was that. Right. And right. it sat and it sat, um, you know, and we never figured we'd ever be able to do it. And this is like way before we have digital recording and computers and all of that stuff. Right. It's like, you right. got a, you got three guys at the mixing board and they're all reaching around messing with knobs and stuff. Right. Um, and you got to get it right in real time, or you got to do the whole thing all over again. Sure. Sure. Um, and so <clears throat> the, uh, the process was, uh, cumbersome to say the least. And, uh, it, the, the, Master tapes, I got my mitts on in 2002. Um, I had Whoa. bought a, a Roland digital workstation because I had a room in my house that I could use for a recording. And they're like, all right. I did a few albums for other people. I did a lot of demoing myself. But the thing I really wanted was to get the Nor'easter tracks in there so oh. I could actually edit them and mix them and do something with it. So uh, the, the engineer had moved to South Carolina by that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stopped through at the end of a tour, spent an afternoon transferring everything into the into the workstation. I remember calling a drummer on my cell phone on the way home. And I left him a message on his answering machine saying, hey, man, I finally got a hold of the recording. Oh, I get to God. Work on this. And uh, I didn't right. realize that he was already in the hospital with the, the lung oh. infection that would take his life just a oh. few days later. Wow. So uh, that kind of just took all the wind out of our sails. And it really was the pandemic of like just being desperate to do something creative. Sure. To have some purpose for doing something because it was like, how long are we going to be locked up like this and, and not able to go out in the world? And, and just, you know, I, I was my mental health was on the on the brink of of right. uh, just coming apart completely. And that project really kind of helped keep me sane and keep me oh. going and to be able to, I mean, so many wonderful things happen from that. Oh my goodness. Um, the, the, the singer hasn't sung for another band since those days, the bass player long ago moved to Tennessee. Um, he'd played with us live, but he wasn't around when we did the recording. So I'd played all the bass, but oh. the three of us started talking as we were going through the recording process and, it was just real healing, you know, and but to, to hear that music that we made when we were like in our early 20s and and hear how well it stands up, you know, it's just like, wow. You said you wanted to be mine all the time While the while you were out running round You said you wanted love That ain't what you're thinking of When you're driving towards the other end of town Kind of think of it as matt's legacy project you know we were yeah. able to share his talent with his kids who are now adults with families of their own and stuff and just uh yeah a lot oh, <laughs> I, I guess I, you know when i talk about all of these things i'm like man that sounds crazy you really did that yeah <laughs> i guess i did man I, i've been lucky enough to lead this like eclectic bizarre wonderful blessed life as a creative 
musician type. Oh, totally. And that's not all you do. And um, and we'll we'll talk about some of that too. But it, you, yeah, it is wonderful experiences. I guess the er, eight, late eighties, early nineties was the BA from Connecticut College, um, and the MS, as you said, from UMass Amherst. It was then that you had the the the, the trio bar band. Um, you know, with your two high school buddies, still making some money. But then you talk about discovering, you know, what the intimacy, the power of solo singing and songwriting. Was that the was that the moment when things largely kicked into the Andrew McKnight solo world of music? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I when I was in grad school, one of my housemates was a fan of people like John Gorka and Sean Colvin. He turned me yeah. on to them and I'm like, man. Wow. Listen to that. Listen to all of the, all of the dynamic range and energy and all of the things that you can do as a songwriter with that kind of environment. And I was just sort of, I, I, I started diving into writing more solo work, nice. even, even those last couple of years that I was at UMass, probably so early nineties, oh. when I came to Virginia and in, in, uh, in the end of 92, I was like, okay, for the first time in my life, I'm going to have two nickels to rub together because <laughs> I've got a master's degree in environmental engineering and a job. And so no more playing right. in smoky bars, right? No right. more hauling amps around and two o'clock in the morning loading up and all that. The heck with it. I'm not doing any of that. I'm making music now for me and I'm going to have a great time doing that. And, um, you know, I went to a few open mics and stuff and then, stuff started mushrooming with all of that and it, uh, it seems like it did 93 was the the period where you had that environment engineering gig and uh, you got your home studio of sorts and were able to settle in as you said the songwriting the solo music 1995 about 31 years old you debuted with traveler and um that sounded like the beginning of a wonderful run some amazing places to play like the one we know right here at Kennedy Center which the fact that you yeah. played there is so wonderful and the Atlanta Olympics yeah. in 1996 um that had to be very very exciting to be able to begin th the solo nature of your life with those two gigs as well as other things I'm sure that really made it a wonderful beginning run yeah it was crazy um, you know, I, and I was still working as an engineer, um, up through 96. Right. So it was like, I, I, you know, I played the Olympic village in Atlanta it was, it was just crazy, man. I played for the Cuban judo team yeah. and I got to see, I got to see president Clinton speaking to all of the assembled, uh, um, American Olympians plus all the gold medal winners from all right. these previous Olympics who were there. And, and I got a seat in the theater <laughs> while, while it's all going on. And I run back over when it's time to go play. And the Cuban judo team is hanging out in the, in the cafe in the, in the village where they had us playing. I just got just... back from Cuba after eight, for eight, from eight days there about two weeks ago. So I'm like, yeah, Cuban uh, judo. That sounds fun. Nice. No, nice. that's that 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 still that still had to be wonderful though uh to begin now it, w w was there a lot of playing live when this debut cd came out and and that began to be part of your world too yeah i started uh i started touring i guess um a bit at the end of 94 i started playing a little bit more outside the washington baltimore corridor um i remember when Traveler came out. I went down to play. Oh, I think I was doing a show in Asheville or in Black Mountain, maybe at the Gray Eagle in Black Mountain, oh, and then okay. a show in Johnson City, Tennessee. And I think it was the first time that I had been down that way to play. And uh, I remember driving in like freezing rain on my way to Asheville, and I'm listening to the local NPR station. And at you know four o'clock or five o'clock, they start playing music and they're playing acoustic music and one of my songs is playing oh. on the radio while i'm driving Asheville. i'm like that's that's crazy man wow 15 year old me is in here going what just happened oh my god <laughs> oh that's spectacular i love that so yeah it, it started kind of snowballing and the reason that i wound up leaving environmental engineering was like right. I'm, I'm not doing either of these things to the best of my ability and I can always come back to engineering, but it seems like I ought to strike while the iron is hot here and wow. take advantage of the opportunities that keep popping up here. And so I took a year's leave of absence because no right. engineer does anything rashly. Right. Um, 
<laughs> and uh, I, 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 at the end of that year's leave of absence, I took the professional engineer's exam and passed that. I said, I'm going to take it once and I'm going to pass it on the first shot. And that's that. So I kept that for a long time, but I never wound up going back. Wow. Well, you know, Traveler was it that began things. You had Where This River Runs, which was three years later, which was a download, um, 13 songs, though, and um, turning pages. And for I mean, it seems like things really were going full bore for Andrew McKnight from the, you know, solo songwriting part of his part of your life for those those number of years after you started. Yeah, I like to think that I kind of <clears throat> was lucky to come in on the sort of the the golden age of do it yourself, you know, um, by the time I recorded Traveler, home studio equipment was coming down in cost. I didn't right. record. I haven't recorded any of my albums. I don't want to sit in the engineer's chair and in front of the mic, you know, I want to let other people do the engineering stuff while I'm doing that. So uh, I, I over the course of that time, you could start to have your own email list and your own website. Right. And all of a sudden there are all these companies popping up that, that give you the opportunity to sell your music directly like CD baby, you know, all of these various different things. So by the time I got to my fifth CD, something worth standing for in 2008, um, I think right around then is maybe when Bandcamp started up, but I, you know, you, I, probably a quarter of my income that year was from selling my albums at shows. Sure. You know, so all of that period, you know, through the MP3s into the streaming era, you know, that was really a pretty good time to be an independent artist. I bet. You could do a lot of stuff yourself and, and make a decent livelihood at what you're called to do. Sure. Um, sure. And of course, you know, the, the, the equation started changing with, with, uh, with recordings and downloads and streaming and all of that in that in that next interval and so i was kind of more focusing on playing with the band at that point right and who and what was that what was that band andrew mcknight and beyond borders yes. was um it, and and you know even though we've been on hiatus it's mostly because um les thompson one of my bandmates is one of the founding members of the nitty gritty dirt oh, band. beautiful um, i just had jumped John here just had John McEwen on Living on Music not long ago. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. what's been keeping him busy wow. is is uh, touring with John. And he missed out on so much of that because he left after the Circle album in 72. Right. Yeah. And he really started playing with John again, maybe about 10 years ago. Right. Um, and it's really wonderful for him to start to get, you know, some of the glory that that the rest of the dirt band has had over over that period of time it's wonderful that john's made made so much uh happen that that les has been able to participate in it yes great. yeah um, absolutely what was the beyond borders sound so lisa taylor on drums and percussion and her beautiful voice wow and les's wife stephanie thompson on multiple different instruments so wow. beyond borders was the name of my fourth solo cd but it also described very well our inclination to not be limited in sounds and styles and the way that we did my songs wow. we would you know we if it meant put accordion and banjo together with electric guitar and drums for instance you know we were like really deliberately blurring a lot of the sort of you know, more conventional distinctions between sure. an acoustic ensemble and an electric band or, sure. you know, some of the world beat percussion things. It was, um, and, and we did, we did a, a live album in 2012 right. and did a lot of shows, mostly here around Virginia, West Virginia, um, North Carolina a bit. Right. Um, that was, that was one Virginia night, right? Yeah. One Virginia yeah. night. Right. Oh, that had to be, you know, again, another, well, any other collaborations over the years that really stand out to you? That one was always special because of the people. Too. I bet. And we still, you know, we still do things together. I'm over at Les's studio doing all the Nor'easter work was over at Les's studio. Oh, great. All the album restoration and all of that. Um, Stephanie's son, Dustin, is a wonderful engineer and drummer. And so I've been over there working on projects with... A variety of different people. I've had some of my students in over there. 
But in terms of collaborating, the thing I'm sort of most excited about, I guess, is that um, right before the pandemic, year before the pandemic, I started working with Matt, Mac Bailey from uh, the Limelighters or the Hard Travelers. Um, right. Worked with John Denver a lot. Yep. Left the music business to go back to school for music therapy. Oh. and has devoted his life since to wow. helping our wounded warriors using songwriting yes. as the therapeutic tool. Wow. So his retreats will bring together uh, one on one uh, a songwriter with a, a combat vet or um, a vet dealing with with post traumatic stress. Right. And together the, the veteran shares their story and the songwriter helps turn it into a piece of music. Right. Um, and it all happens in the course of about 30 hours because <laughs> you meet on Saturday morning and by Sunday night, there's a concert for their family and friends and every, all the things happen in, in that little window. So uh, I've done five of those songs where I collaborated with uh, with a vet and every one of them is, wow. is really special. And it's a different kind of collaboration. Right. I, I joke sometimes about how I, I'm a I'm a musician in the music business who is trying desperately to get his music out of the music business <laughs> and directly to where people are are needing music as medicine for the soul kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And, and no place better than than to work with people healing through through that. Um, yeah, that is really very incredible stuff. <clears throat> that is very true. I had a group of ladies on called the Mystic Chicks, um, who are a, 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 a regional. Uh, group of three ladies and they do some very kind of wonderful uh, personal type, you know, kind of uh, uh, treatments and things like that of people who need it, but they use music and music is a big part of their life. So that is, that is a wonderful thing that music can not only make people feel wonderful and sing and love it, but also help them with a lot of other things. You had some, you had three live records uh, along with, you know, you had the, the Appalachians to Austin and bound for glory and Tim to Mukua. Um, um live at but th so that's neat that you the live seemed to be something that's been that's uh, continued to be surging forward to this day for you i found that um the the issue that really drove that was that it was getting to be hard to recoup what you put into a studio recording right and you know i played a lot of shows where they had some really nice recording gear going as part of it wow. and and all three of those albums happened because they were set up for that yeah. and it's like well I, i'm not going to keep this for myself <laughs> but the the cool thing about live records is I, I i i do tell a lot of stories uh and you can have those be part of the recording too i even index them separately because you know a lot of people when they talk about before doing a song it's mostly about kind of where the song comes from or sure. some inspiration for it in the solo singer songwriter world that i grew up with a lot of times the story set up the song and wow. it wasn't about how i wrote the song it was that the story was almost this thread unto itself and going back to the one man theater thing i think that um the way that i i have evolved as an artist is into embracing that right that the stories are just as important a part of the moments because the songs hit deeper yeah. they hit in a different way when the story set them up the story might not even have anything to do with the song but the way it dovetailed it makes a path through the right movie. and it's a it's a it's a journey it gets to be kind of hard for a lot of people this time of year and if you're one of the estimated 20 million americans that suffer from some form of depression when you wake up like that it can feel like that last gunfight at the OK Corral, and you know how it's going to turn out. And I'm here to tell you that when the hour of darkness comes, you are not alone. Fuel flame in my 
my fear Drive a man to desperation From the doubt that he hears And I crumble like stone in the sand Life blows like dust from my Showdown approaches at high noon desert sun on the barren plains of truth. Ain't nowhere to run. They say if a man should wander long enough in the heat and he survives a solitude, his soul he'll meet. And I can run like stone into sand Life blows like dust from my hand I, I wow. describe myself, I guess, as a story tender, kind of mm -hmm. like a bartender, you know? I've been lucky enough to have lived through some crazy stories, and I've mm -hmm. heard a lot of stories, and seen a lot of stuff and it's great that i get to have them wow but it's not my um privilege to keep them right so i think of myself like that barkeep when you walk in and you know you tell him what you want it's like he's going to make you the best of what he's got well my job is to distill down those stories nice. mix them in just the right proportions and pour them for you to take in in a way that's really like ah uh, you know? Uh, no, I love that. That's wonderful thought process going. The songs that you've written, what, we talked about a couple of titles. Any ones that jump out at you that really, really were moving to you to write and then play and perform? Oh, yeah. Um, they're even from my very first album, you know, even even from Traveler, there have been pieces that have stood the test of time that people still ask me to play now almost 30 years later. And right. what higher compliment to a, a, to a songwriter that people are still asking for stuff from your first record all these years later. Totally. And of course, as an artist, you always like to think your most recent work is your, your best work. Right. And hopefully it'll continue to be that way for at least a little while longer. Right. I think um, when I, when I think about that, there's a handful of songs on something worth standing for that really um, were pretty powerful to me because they're a coalescing of like things you wouldn't necessarily think of happening sure. together. Like John Carroll and I wrote bridges oh. together and uh, it was really inspired by me being a new dad, but I had just been at the folk Alliance conference in Memphis and I'd been to the civil rights museum for the first time. Oh. And at the same time that I'm, being a new dad for the first and only time, John's going through being a granddad yes. for the first time. Yeah. So this coalescing of perspectives of the passage of time and how different the experience is for people who are lucky enough to live in safety all the time versus people who live on the margins. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the constant fear and trepidation that, that went along with, you know, growing up black in Mississippi in the forties and the fifties and all of that, you know, the, the way that you have such a different experience and yet somehow hopefully you can capture some empathy by seeing that story through their eyes for sure. Them. That's really my goal as a songwriter is, is more musical cinematographer than song crafter and, and to really draw you into being able to see some sort of movie in your head early just i think it engages you as a listener in a deeper different kind of way right there there are a handful of songs on that record that that i'm really proud of how they came out like that times we're living in and these shoes but i guess um from treasures in my chest the a dram to the holidays was something that i wrote after meeting cousins in northern ireland Oh. my dad's third cousins, two different families, 
the first time that our families had probably been together in the same place in about 170 years. Wow. And at the end of it, they gave me a Loudon guitar to take home oh, that had been in their family for like 20 years. And it turned out that it was made in the hometown of our great, great grandparents, the McKnight, uh, great, great oh. grandparents. So I wrote a dram to the holidays because I thought I, the first thing that I write on this guitar has to be something about this thing that ties us together over nearly two centuries oh. that none of us ever had any inkling about. And yet this guitar is kind of symbolic of all of it. slumber deep in their beds tucked close in a room much too small their dreams burn brightly far more than they should have reason enough to believe Lord give them a of the past and hold tight to the best of what's been we're still here at the holidays again some of the songs that came out of out of out of the whole like ancestry bit you know, sure deep deep like that and like the the experiences that led to them happening were just crazy Oh, that is uh, that is wonderful. I love that. You uh, obviously, in addition to the music these days, are you continuing to teach guitar and songwriting? Um, uh, is that part of your your life right now? Absolutely. Yep. Oh wow. I uh, I I set up my teaching schedule a long time ago because I've been lucky enough to live within a day's drive of about 120 million people. <laughs> so I could hit the road in one direction and play three or four shows on the weekend, come back home, be a present dad, right. and husband and all of that. And then uh, head off in a different direction right. you know, later and still be able. So the teaching guitar and teaching songwriting kind of evolved fairly early on with that so that I, had some, you know, some buffer. It, it, there are times when it's not great to be out on the road, right? Um, like around Christmas, unless you're doing Christmas shows, it's kind of, you know, you're a little bit more of an uphill struggle. So to have a, a base of teaching here, I always think that my life is sort of this circle of uh, the intersection of three circles, create, teach, learn. I live right. in the middle. I live in the middle of that Venn diagram right there. Um, so my students are always giving me really cool insights and ideas about all kinds of things artistically. Well, if you're, and you've written songs with as young as kindergartners, which I love that possibility. You, you remember any one song that stood out as, that you wrote with a kindergartner? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I wrote it on the mandolin, and it's just oh. a strummy, strummy thing on the mandolin. But uh, um, it was Valentine's Day. Oh, <laughs> and and I remember I asked the kids, uh, it was a couple weeks before Valentine's Day, but they were, you know, they're cutting out red paper hearts and all that kind of stuff. And so when I came in that day, I was like, so what do you want to write about? Let's write a love song. I'm like, you're five. What do you know about love? <laughs> this is what you know about love. Everybody needs some. Everybody oh wants some. All right. You got to give a little to get a little. And before we knew it, we had this like really 
high energy sing along kind of song about I call it the kindergarten love song, but everybody needs to to give a little love. Everybody needs to get a little love, and and it was kindergarten or wisdom, right? Oh, crazy stuff. No, I love that. Everybody needs to give a little love. Everybody needs to get a little love. Everybody wants to have a little love that makes the world go round. Seems so simple, doesn't it? All of the babies need a little love. All the kindergarten need a little love. All of the big kids need a little love that makes the world go round. Everybody needs to give a little love. Everybody needs to get a little love. Everybody wants to have a little love that makes the world go round. And then you also did some stuff with some veterans to help heal, help their healing their PTSD. Were there songs written with them too? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the project I was mentioning with Mac a, a little earlier. Yes. Um, writing, writing the. Uh, I, there was a retreat down in North Carolina last year, and I got to write with a female vet for the first time. That was really pretty powerful stuff too. Oh man, I mean, yeah. Andrew, what a what a what a wonderful ride you 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 have with your own music, helping other people with music. It is all from somebody who has got a show living on music. You're living on music, and 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 then some. You also have some wonderful stuff which I'm sure includes writing for your next record uh, in 2024. Um, but they're, they seem to be as diverse as, you know, the interests you have, you're doing, uh, producing too many documentaries. Can you give us a little bit of a clip on the, a little bit of a thought on those? Sure. Um, right up the street from where the cancer can rock benefit is happens to be the home laboratory of fair built guitars oh yeah <laughs> and my friend marty fair is a master luthier um oh, yeah and about 10 years ago um yeah. Eh, 10 years yeah 10 years ago um we had been talking for a while about him building a guitar for me and so finally let's let's like move this into yes let's do it right i said actually my pitch to him was you build such beautiful guitars and everybody who owns one lives within 20 miles of here. Your guitars need to be heard. I volunteer to be the guy to take one on the road. Wow. And so, so uh, we were we were talking about it and we had it all kind of figured out. And, and it's sort of on an offhand comment, I kind of tossed it out on a whim. I'm like, you know, so many of my songs are from here, you know, from the Shenandoah Valley and Blue Ridge country and all that. Wouldn't it be cool if we made this guitar out of local native wood? What do you think? Can we capture the sound of home in a guitar? Oh, so Marty, uh, I, 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 I love telling the story because it's still funny to me even thinking about it. But Marty's dad taught physics. And so here he is a craftsman. But he's a scientist too. Oh. And so he started thinking about what this might look like. Right. And and he's like, you know, I kind of, I have these different pieces of wood here in the shop and I've been kind of wanting to, to test them out. So instead of building me one guitar, he wound up building six oh. identical guitars, all done the same way, wow. except the back and sides were of different local native woods. They all have this West Virginia red spruce top on them. And uh, we actually took them up to the studio and, and you know, uh, uh, tested them out, recorded, uh, you know, re recorded them several different places and all that and, and found that it wasn't the back and sides wood that made all that much difference. It was really the top. There was only oh. one of the guitars that sounded appreciably different from the others. But oh, so man. we made a movie about it. <laughs> and uh, the movie is coming out now because what wound up happening, we had a premiere for it um, in Herndon at the Arts Center. The band played, we showed the movie, it was great. And we were working on some edits over the next few weeks after that. And it was one of those automatic software updates. And uh, the, the video guy calls me up one day, he says, dude, the timeline's been completely dissembled. Oh. You know, it's like the, the movie's been taken apart. We got to like do all of that all over again. It's like, oh, we just okay. ran out of steam, right? Right. So uh, the, the woman who did all the videography for it, so she's a marvelous photographer too. And she's done some really cool, uh, cool film. And she stumbled over it a few weeks ago. And she's like, 
you know, we never released this and it's really good. Why don't we, why don't we do something with it? So oh. we're going to have a premiere for it on YouTube here in a few weeks. And Oh, great. Yes. Really cool. Yeah. Let me know about that. Cause I definitely want to share what you're doing with that. If you, if you want to do, want to share it with, with me, I'd love that. You're Absolutely. also helping your cousin. Is that Suzanne? Yeah. Like my, yeah. my partner's name, Suzanne, Luke, Luke, Luther, Luke, 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 yeah. and, and, and she has a one woman stage show called little blue suitcase. Give us a nutshell on what that is with her. That sounds fun. She is my second cousin whom I discovered after my parents took the DNA test, what? my grandfather had a sister who was an opera singer oh. and the black sheep of the family. She <laughs> went to California, lived her life. I knew nothing of her except that she existed and that we were to never mention her name around my grandfather. Oh. God. <laughs> like, well, tell a kid that. Oh, yeah, really. <laughs> Go ahead. Good luck. So Aunt Margaret always was on my radar. And right. I finally, um, when, when we got to, uh, you know, researching the family and, and the DNA testing and all that, I found some of her descendants. Well, it turns out Aunt Margaret had had like five husbands and four kids, three kids. And, and those kids had, you know, multiple marriages and kids and all of that too. Her two youngest daughters, one was another opera singer and the other was a jazz singer who went by the name Vicki Hamilton. And she had a, a, a jazz band with a guy named Dave Mackay out in Southern California in the late sixties, recorded an album for Blue Note with oh. Joe Pass playing guitar. I mean, wow. the A-list of LA jazz session cats. And here is my cousin singing on, she wrote half of these songs, holy crap. I knew Whoa. nothing of her and she, she had passed away, um, in like 1971, early 1971. Wow. Right. Suzanne is her daughter. Oh, and we discovered each other through one of our, our family oh. and she's a marvelous actress. She worked for Disney in Orlando doing oh. like six shows a day for That's 15 great. years and, and, and her life with the jazz singer was not a life with a jazz singer. She kept getting put off at foster homes. Oh. She's writing a story about her life in part because when she says, yeah, that, that was family number nine out of 11. <laughs> people are like, what? Right. You know, what a, what a story, what a life and finding the humor in all of that. Um, so she's been, it's basically kind of an autobiographical show. And I know a fair amount about her family history and our shared musical genetic legacy right she shares that same great grandfather who wrote margaret oh um, so yeah really uh really deep cool stuff she's a, a marvelous singer she teaches singing in in pasadena and um she's at this you know it's kind of like the 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 cap to her career kind of thing is working on this show oh and fantastic. it's an honor to help her with it but it's also really cool to you know my ancestry stuff didn't only just start a project for me it's helping me do a project with another family member sure oh that is amazing andrew just this 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 run of what you do is very very impressive and just fulfilling i bet it must feel absolutely wonderful to to kind of blend all these things in along with of course your song singing and songwriting and performing i'm the luckiest guy i know <laughs> <laughs> well we are too to have you on here i would love it if you would do us the honor of giving us a little bit of andrew mcknight playing and just give us a sense of you uh right here on living on music what possibly could we hear you uh give us well um the veteran songs are, are pretty uh, front of mind these days. So right. uh, maybe uh, maybe I'll do one of those and let's make sure that you can actually hear the guitar like a guitar and hear my voice like the like a voice. And Sounds tremendously drop real. The camera down a little bit and yeah, perfect. I think uh, I think I'll play one of the ones that uh, that uh, came out of the 2019. Uh, I, there was this this veteran from Michigan. Um, quiet, uh, real thoughtful guy. And, and we were talking for a while. And the, the one common thread with all of these vet songs is that pretty much every one of them that's been at these retreats came to the point where they um, 
had had more than enough and they were right. ready to sign off duty for that final time wow. and be done. And something, someone, some event pulled right. them back. Mm -hmm. Sure. In his case, that event was a very public and powerful one. And um, when the adrenaline was finally wearing off and he was sitting there in the, in the police station and talking to talking to the, um, the therapist and stuff and kind of just making sense out of it. He says, you know, even in the heat of the moment, he said, I, I was thinking about the 22 veterans a day on average who take their own lives. And he right. said, I guess, I guess at the end of it, I, I decided that, um, you know, today I'm going to make a different choice I'm wow. going to, choose to live today. Oh my. So his song's called life. I choose beautiful. Let's see if we got enough. You got good sound there for it. Okay. Yes, sir. I've been Flatland, Michigan, the radio's on a Teenage dad in a country song Graduates all go away Two baby girls need me to stay behind Sign my name on the dotted line Wrote a blank check, went to Paris Band of brothers like no other bond Be a Marine, you can be someone All those years of training Found a moment of grace Moment of mercy staring face to face In that moment I saw nothing I found everything Things I believe made me someone Might as well take my soul and take my bones An empty shell all alone in the darkness And all those years of training Found a moment of grace Moment of mercy staring from the rubble that I have found It took a lot of pride and a lot of heart to take a chance at a second start at being alive and All that lifetime of training found a moment of grace Moment of mercy staring face to face In that moment I saw Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. That to me is, is, is representative of what I have learned about you over the last few weeks um, before we got to talk today. And I'm telling you, man, 
very, very talented as well as diverse on what you're doing. I want to thank you so much for sharing this Andrew McKnight ride with me on Living on Music, man. Thank you so much for having me, my friend. It's an sure. honor to be here. I've, I'm just uh, grateful and humbled to take my place in the pantheon of fabulous artists that you've had already. Well, you fit right in. And especially when people hear that live from from this, that was they're, they're going to hear little moments of your of your performing throughout the show. But wow, I, I thank you so much for that. I want to wish you the best of luck in 24 with all these really just wonderful things you're doing, as well as the music. When do you think we might be uh, seeing the next uh, Andrew McKnight uh, record coming out? I'm going to say it's probably a 2025 project. Cool. Um, I think uh, the things that I've been working on of late are kind of about getting back to being out on the road. I mean, right. it's been fits and starts, as lots of people can tell you. You know, th tours uh, tours grind to a halt suddenly because somebody gets COVID or right. somebody at the venue that's vital to the thing gets COVID. There's still mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, gigas interruptus going on out there that. Uh, that's been a bit of a challenge. So big time. I think uh, I think the next project is going to be a collection of these songs written with vets. And I'm oh, perfect. I'm hoping to get to another retreat or two this year to to do some more of that work. Well, good. I'm glad I uh, sang a, at a gig at Kilroy's in Springfield for, with my band Second Wind about four four months ago, five months ago, and got COVID two days later <laughs> from the crowd. So that darn thing is still ro rolling around. Our drummer got it in Second Wind uh, two weeks ago, and we had to cancel a, a rehearsal. But I want to wish you the very best of luck with all of this. Um, and let's keep in close touch uh, so I can kind of let people know about what you're doing as we go forward, because there is a lot to share. <laughs> there is. <laughs> Great. I really appreciate that, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, man. We'll keep in touch. Whew. Andrew McKnight, wow, you are one special music man, and I really, really hope things go well for you in 2024. It's been an incredible ride, and uh, we'll keep in, um, hopefully be able to uh, to know what each other is doing and what you're doing with this, but um, I want to definitely keep in close touch. Everybody, if you want to join Living on Music on Facebook, go right over, dial it up, Living on Music with Steve Hack on Facebook, and become a member, um, and you'll get um, specially pinged with uh, some amazing stuff across the musical spectrum. And you can also go to YouTube uh, on Living on Music with Steve Hack and subscribe, and then you'll get um, just little bit little pings on, on exactly what episodes are coming up and things like that if you're a subscriber. And if you're a podcast fan, um, you can go to Spreaker right here. Uh, Spreaker.com with Living on Music on Steve, with Steve Hauken. You'll find uh, all my podcasts there. Or you go to your favorite podcast app and dial in Living on Music with Steve Hauken. You'll find those podcasts. So that's how you kind of keep up to date with us. We'd love to have you as a subscriber, a member, and a part of the Living on Music Nation. So please do that. In the meantime, if you want to keep steady, keep happy, keep stable, you know what to do. Just keep living on music. <laughs>